welcome to the Quincy Access Television Studios. I'm Mark Crosby. Thank you for joining us for Department Profiles. Department Profiles basically is just that. It profiles a department within the city of Quincy, helps you to stay informed. Joining me today from the historic and Heritage Resources is its director. That director would be Bob Damon. Bob, so glad to have you finally in QATB. I know you've been here in other capacities in the past, but uh, specifically to talk about your department, so glad to have you join us. Mark, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the time and appreciate the opportunity to share uh, the kind of work that we're doing in the city with and, regard to its historic resources. And there is a lot uh, going on. There is a lot of history here in the city of Quincy. No one would be surprised to hear that. Talk about, I guess, before we get to your department, talk about your history and uh, maybe what brought you to this point. All right, well, so uh, my, my career with history really began as in, uh, in education. So I was a high school history teacher for about seven years up in uh, Vermont, just north of Burlington, Vermont, uh, and came back to the Boston area just, oh, about 15 years ago now uh, to get a degree in public history um, and be working at historic sites. Uh, and my first job was actually at the Old North Church in Boston. Not a bad place to start. Um, and I was there until about 2013 um, and then moved into consulting uh, work, mostly because I had two young kids uh, and a wife who was, uh, had a busy professional schedule. So um, I hung out my own shingle uh, and did some work as a director of a local historical society for a while. Um, and some of that consulting uh, services eventually brought me here to the United First Parish Church. Um, where I was brought in by the then president to be the director for their um, history and visitors program, where you can go and tour um, the church and see the tombs of the presidents and first ladies. Um, and I did that work through until 2019. Um, just a little bit before that, the mayor came and asked me to do some work for the city, um, evaluating the city's historic heritage resources um, and their well-being, basically. Uh, and did that report with him, uh, and then the mayor brought me on board uh, in the position I am today as the director for, for the Department of Historic and Heritage Resources. So if folks are unaware of this department or maybe know a little bit about it, the idea of this program is to really uh, get um, the information out there to folks for them to know more. So talk about this current position and what this department does. A lot of collaborations, correct? Yes, yeah, so it's a, it's a more of a non-traditional role than, than, than your traditional city departments, natural resources or public buildings or things like that. It's really my job very specifically to help care for historic heritage resources that are owned by the city of Quincy. So when you're really clear about that, I don't have any jurisdiction to be working at the National Park Service with the Adams family sites or anything like that. Um, I help various department directors to care for resources that are under their particular department's ownership. That certainly could, would include public buildings, um, natural resources, uh, are really the pr two primary ones that I work with. Um, but I also work a lot with uh, the tourism department, obviously, as we look at different kinds of historic programs that are related to those historic places. So when we talk about city-owned properties, uh, I guess, uh, give us a rundown of what that might include, maybe uh, some current uh, projects that, that are being looked at? Sure, sure. So I've, perhaps the most obvious are, are historic cemeteries, um, certainly Hancock Cemetery, Mount Wollaston Cemetery, the two Sailors Home Cemeteries. They're all great examples of those kinds of, of resources, um, but there are also historic buildings. Um, so the Thomas Crane Library would be a wonderful example of that. Um, obviously, I wouldn't be working on those directly, but working certainly with um, the library's folks, uh, as well as with Paul Hines, the public buildings director. Um, so those are some good examples of some of the kinds of sites that I would be working with. And I think, if I'm mistaken, let me know that the Richardson Room at the Thomas Crane Public Library, which is the original part of the library, yes. correct, will be undergoing some renovation. Uh, it will be. Um, again, most of that happening through the Public Buildings Department and working with Sarah, the new uh, library's director. Um, so if there's a need for me to help, uh, then I jump in um, and support with them. There's so many properties within the city of Quincy that are historic. And uh, there is some news related to, some current news related, related to 
many of them. And I'd like to start with the furnace, the blast furnace, because that is, uh, first of all, you taught me something here today prior to us recording about uh, the history of that furnace and the fact that it wasn't really, it was a short-lived operation. But talk a little bit about that, a little history about that, and what uh, you look to do with that uh, particular site. Sure. So it's it's called the John Winthrop Jr. Iron Furnace, technically, um, because it was founded and created by the son of John Winthrop, who was the governor of, you know, Rogue, a, a, well, I should say a pre-colonial governor uh, here in Massachusetts. Um, and John Winthrop Jr. was somebody who was fascinated by metals, but he was also an entrepreneur and a businessman. Um, and he convinced a, a group of investors to invest in the construction of a furnace for the production of metals here in North America, with the idea that that could be a very lucrative business given the demand for those things here. Uh, he eventually settled on Quincy because of the large amount of bog iron, so there were a lot of swamps in Quincy originally, um, and he built the blast furnace you know, in the 1640s here. Um, but the lack of good material and water would make it unreliable. Um, if folks don't know where that's located today, it's located on Crescent Street, um, just right next to the Hall Cemetery. Um, and the site itself was one that was excavated uh, by the same gentleman who would actually find Thoreau's Walden Cabin. Um, and so he would excavate it in the 50s and then he would restore it um, in the 60s. Uh, that was quite a long time ago. Um, and his restoration is needing some pretty significant help right now. So um, thanks to the Local Community Preservation Act, we're going to be doing a um, restoration of his reconstructed base of the John Winthrop Jr. Iron Furnace over there on Crescent Street. I'm glad you mentioned the CPA, the Community Preservation Act, because that is key to restoring these sites. It is. It is. It's a, um, it's a really, really important piece of public policy. I mean, obviously, I may, I may sound a little biased about that, but I think it's one of the really important local community assets that Quincy has really taken strong advantage of um, and the community has been able to take a lot of strong advantage of um, as a support for really important resources in our community that we value and that really do require resources in order to care for them over time. Um, so it's a huge asset for, for the community here. And we should also mention that uh, that was decided upon by the voters to contribute to that fund. Yes, absolutely. So the Community Preservation Act has to be approved by local voters, and it is done community by community. So not all communities in Massachusetts have the Community Preservation Act. Um, but it's had a huge impact here on, on Quincy and its historic heritage. Let's move from the furnace to the Souther Tide Mill because they are connected in a way. Uh, so the su Southern Tide Mill uh, down on Southern Artery right next to the CVS if you don't know it. Um, and uh, that, is, that building has been there, stood there since 1855. Um, it, is a re it was rebuilt after a fire um, in the 40s um, by the Souther family who, for whom the building is named. Um, that is the area around the Tide Mill, and the Tide Mill itself is one of the city's last or oldest commercial waterfront properties um, in the community at the moment. Um, the original wharves um, that are there um, include granite blocks that were built as a part of the construction of the Quincy Canal in the early 1820s. Um, and the original dam for uh, the Tide Mill was actually um, uh, secured by Ebenezer Thayer, the Thayer family, if you think of Thayer, Thayer Academy. Academy. Okay. Yep. Um, and that was back in 1802, and the first dam was built there in 1806. Um, and it was used to capture tidal waters, so as water came in, it would be captured behind the dam, and then once the tide had gone out, it would be used to run water through a sluice gate to turn a mill, just so we could think of wheel mills, um, to grind grain. So I guess um, maybe the most recent connection between the two is that that also, that site also, will see some work being done. There has been yes, some work that yes, thank you. has yeah. previously been done, but there is more to be done. Yes, so the city, um, who, who is the owner of both the, mil the building and the property abutting it, um, are involved in a major project to begin a master planning process to care for both the building and the property, the, the old, what I call the old Thayer Wharves. Um, the main reason for that is sea level rise. 
those are two of our more vulnerable historic resources here in the city of Quincy. Um, during king tides, so tides above 12 feet these days in that part of um, Town River Bay, um, we have about one third of the property being inundated uh, by tidal waters. Um, and they're about an inch below the shingles just at, at the base of the building. Um, so we have some really important work to be done to figure out what to do about how to care for and to preserve and to maintain those important historic resources here in the city. And I know that there is a nonprofit group that has been formed uh, to support the tide mill, correct? Yes, it's, and it's been around for a long time. And that community has, that particular community organization has been essential in keeping an, a laser focus on the attention and care for and the importance of that historic mill building, which is one of only two remaining in Massachusetts at this point. There used to be hundreds all across Massachusetts two. and the Eastern Seaboard. Yes, there are only two remaining. Interesting. And I think, I don't know if this is part of the master plan, but there was talk about possibly having a kayak launch close by? So again, the, the possibilities, so one of the, I, I should back up for a second and say that in historic preservation, one of the, the, the common ways to keep a historic resource, a building, a piece of property or land um, from being destroyed or changed or altered is what's called adaptive reuse. So finding new constructive ways that maintain the historic resource, but also give it some additional value in the current day that helps to prevent other developmental pressures that might impact it or have it be torn down. I almost like think that. about the Jenny Grist mill and how that has been kind of repurposed in Plymouth. Yes, yep, the exact, that's the exact perfect example of that. Um, and so the idea of um, how the property that abuts the mill might be go into some adaptive reuse um, is something that the city is in process with. Another property that uh, I guess has received some news recently, uh, especially in light of the Granite Links 100 year lease, and that is the Lions Turning Mill, correct? Yes, the Lions Turning Mill. It is the last, the very last uh, remnant of the history of Quincy's granite industry. Um, and the which was big. Which was big. Yes, so if we think about the 19th century, there were 54 working um, granite quarries in the city of Quincy, what we now know as the city of Quincy, uh, during its height. Um, you went to the Centennial Expedition, ex Exposition excuse me, in Philadelphia, you the premier supplier of any kind of premier stone in the United States, Quincy Granite. Um, so the Quincy Quarry and Granite Workers Museum, which is within the old Lions Turning Mill ruins, um, is really the last place where folks can see that history uh, and see it in some really comp compelling and interesting ways. So I know that this has been picked up by the Department of Natural Resources in the city. Yes. But what uh, do you know of, of any future plans, uh, any master plan for that site to again become uh, maybe a working piece of history? I think in the past, Folks have gone there for photos. A lot of uh, brides sure. have chosen that place yep. because it is unique. And a lot of people can live in the city of Quincy and not realize that that's there. Once you get to that site, um, it really, I suppose, takes you back to another time easily. Yes. Well, and, and I should say back up and say that I think the, the turning mill is a really wonderful example of the ways in which community members recognize, who recognize the importance of particular pieces of their community's history can make a real impact on saving that history. Um, and so there are quite a few members of the, of the Quincy Quarry and Granite Workers Museum, um, but I would call out two, um, Albina and Tom Bonomi, um, two gentlemen who have spent an incredible amount of time looking into, researching, and understanding the history of this this community with regard to uh, Quincy, uh, to quarrying and to granite um, and have made ex really extraordinary efforts not only to really reclaim, quite literally reclaim the Lions Turning Mill site from the forest that had grown up around it, um, but have also played an, a, an essential part in helping to save um, important artifacts from the industry. Literally, the last stone sheds would close and Al and Tom would be there backing up a truck 
to pick up machinery, equipment, anything that they, they can to save um, related to its history. And right now the Turning Mill site is in the process of being transformed into a landscape, historic landscape museum. So a place where people can see all of the different phases of granite quarrying, from what it took to extract the stone from the ground, all the way through to what took it to, to cut it and to finish it and polish it, cut it, carve it, all the elements that went into creating stone in a way that would bring it to market. We're mentioning a lot of nonprofit groups. I'm thinking, yes, there are a lot of groups here in the city of Quincy that really see the value of our history. Southern Tide Mill, the Turning Mill, and I guess more recent history, the Ruth Gordon Amphitheater. Certainly, yeah. And again, uh, just another wonderful way in which um, community members are getting involved with their history. And I would say to you, this is a really wonderful example of how historic preservation works in the United States. So if you go to Europe, many countries in Europe have governmental subsidy for historic preservation. Um, and we do have some of that here in the United States, but we do it a little bit differently. Um, and in the United States, what it really requires or incents, the system really incents this idea of valuing particular things. Um, and it's essential that we identify or understand what the, value, the historic value is of a place. And then that people take the time to turn that value into action. And, the, and I think the Ruth Gordon Amphitheater is a wonderful example of folks who have see the value in that place and, and have turned it into action with the, the summer series they're doing this summer. Absolutely. You and I, uh, we cross paths quite a bit at City Hall. And um, I guess the last time that uh, I was there to cover a meeting, I noticed that you had some interns with you. So there is a summer intern program now. We are recording this at the end of July. This summer intern program runs till about mid-August. Uh, but I guess that's going to bring me I, I guess that's going to lead me to discussions about the school department and your collaboration with the school department and I guess summer internships in general and what these interns have been doing this July and will be doing in August. So I, I have a real privilege to be able to work directly with Quincy Public Schools both during the school year and during the summer. Um, and it's, it's one of the things I love to do as part of my job. And it's a real privilege that I, that I get to do it. Um, so during the school year, um, I helped to teach um, a elective program uh, called the Student Docent Program. And this is a legacy program that came out of a field trip program that used to involve the Museum of Fine Arts. Um, and the MFA would train 10th grade students to be peer docents for 9th grade students um, who came to visit um, the museum during their ninth grade year. Um, that program unfortunately ended during COVID um, and with the help of a number of very savvy uh, coordinators for that program both in uh, North Quincy and Quincy High as well as the support of the administration um, and some department heads, we, we transformed that to be a local program here in Quincy. Um, and so during the school year, uh, students take four days um, to be a part of a, a training program to learn about historic interpretation. Um, and then they cap that particular experience off as peer guides for their fellow 10th grade students who are visiting a local historic site. So for example, this year the students did their training and learned about historic interpretation while they were also learning the stories or the narrative or tell, giving a tour at the Dorothy Quincy Homestead. Um, and the main reason that folks at the Quincy Homestead wanted us to do the program there um, was related to the historic house manager Susan Bennett's desire to be able to hire young people with the skills in historic interpretation to work with her during the summer programs. So coincidentally, again, we're, we're recording this just at the uh, end of July. This coming weekend is, is one of the weekends when the Dorothy Quincy Homestead will be open. It's open on the first and third Saturdays of every month through October. And there will be students there who are guiding visitors through the, through the Historic House Museum. So we, students who do the docent program um, also have the opportunity to participate in a summer youth internship program uh, that is coordinated by me, as you mentioned. Um, that program provides students with a placement at one historic site um, 
uh, or one day a week, excuse me, at a historic site for six weeks over the course of the summer. And we should mention those sites. Um, so those sites this year include um, providing tours of the Hancock Adams Common and the Hancock Cemetery, uh, the United First Paris Church, um, the USS Salem, both as guides and greeters on board the ship and also working in the United States Naval Shipbuilding Museum's archives, um, and then at the Quincy Historical Society, and as I'd already mentioned, at the Dorothy Quincy Homestead. So talk about, I guess, a little bit more maybe about the process of, of getting these young students up to speed in uh, the, I guess, suppose, presentation of history. So th these young people get professional training in historic interpretation, just like I used to give to folks who wanted to be a guide, a tour guide at the Old North Church when I worked there. Um, I bring in one of my very good close uh, museum education colleagues, uh, and she and I coordinate the program. Um, and I very often bring in uh, guest scholars. So for example, at the Dorothy Quincy Homestead, uh, Susan Bennett, again, the historic house manager there, interested in broadening the stories that the homestead was telling uh, about the homestead, uh, and in particular to include um, talking about uh, enslaved individuals uh, who lived and, and were a part of the Quincy family. Um, so we had a scholar in New England slavery who came in and did several um, presentations related to New England slavery for the students so they understood more about it. Um, and we provide the training related to what it, would, what it takes to be a historic interpreter. Um, and then they practice and implement those skills at the historic site. And again, in this case, it was the Dorothy Quincy Homestead. You know, I guess my thought um, is there has to be a knack for delivering historic information today. There are some real challenges to how you compose um, what you're gonna say, the content, and also how you deliver it. Um, and I think one of the things I will say is that in all of my work doing this, I find actually that young people pick up the skills necessary to be a good storyteller. Everything's easier when you're younger, it really is. <laughs> well, it is, but I, I, again, I think that it sort of defies some of the stereotypes, I think, okay. ab about young people in that regard. Um, they really do have an inter a genuine interest, and in some cases, not some of those same well-established habits or hang-ups that we might have you know, we might have acquired as adults related to this. Um, and I really will say the other important piece related to this program is it is designed to help stu expose students to the idea of public history and historic interpretation as a potential job or a career path. But I think in, in many more ways, it's as important for in the process of some self-actualization. Um, one of the, the key things that we remind students of is that when a visitor comes in and is going to hear them give a presentation, they may feel nervous inside and be worried about, well, will I remember everything I have to say? And what we say to them is, if you forgot something, if you forgot something, is your visitor ever going to know? And the answer, of course, is, of course not. And anybody who comes through the door is going to know significantly less than you do before they've even walked through the door. And that person may come back again and pick up um, more history about that specific site. So these young people have the opportunity to be, you know, what colloquially would be called being the sage on the stage. They have the rare opportunity to be the one who's in charge, the one delivering the information, sharing information with people who are motivated enough to come to the site in the first place to learn its history. So all of those things are really, I think, very gratifying for a lot of them in terms of them feeling a lot more confidence in themselves. Um, and finding the enjoyment of speaking to people who might come from Australia, China, all, all places all around the world that come here to Quincy to learn about its history. And I should, uh, with that said, I should ask you, who do these students meet up with? I mean, they meet up with folks from different countries, as you, as you had just mm -hmm. said. Uh, what's, the, uh, what's the range, or maybe where are some of the areas that these folks are coming into Quincy? Where are they coming from? All right, well, so we, we do know that we have visitors usually from all 50 states come here to Quincy uh, to visit primarily to see and hear about the Adams family and the Adams presidents. Uh, and usually somewhere between 30 and 40 countries a year um, come to the community, folks from those different countries. So, and we're beginning to see that international travel pick up again. Um, again, we have a wonderful tourism director, Dagny Ashley, who is really responsible for 
helping to get the word out about this community and bring various folks here. But uh, I, one great example I would give would be we were at the Dorothy Quincy Homestead with students practicing uh, and get preparing to give um, tours to their classmates. Um, and quite literally, a couple from Australia walked through the gates and came up to the house because they saw people there and saw that it was open. And the tour guide who normally works there said, I'm sorry, we're not open today. And three of the kids said, oh, well, we'll take you. And they took the couple off through the house on a tour. Talk about, if you could, if there's any news regarding the Adams Library. That would be a new addition to the city. Uh, the mayor is very interested in constructing that building. Any news there? Or I know the, the primary focus, or maybe not the primary focus, but one of the attractions would be letters if, if those uh, were released from the Boston Public Library. So, and you're referencing the Adams Presidential Center, right? Just yes. So, uh, okay. Oh, right, because so, the Adams Library is part of the, um, the current Stone Library. There might be some confusion there, correct? Right, yeah. right. Um, so the, it also want to make sure we differentiate the city's operations from the Presidential Center, which is a separate a new nonprofit organization Another here group, in the community. correct. Yes. Um, and so I, I am one of the advisors, so I'm one of the co-chairs for the advisory committee for the Adams Presidential Center. So I have a little bit of information I can share, probably not as much as, as, the, as the current director, Rich Mahoney, might be able to share. Um, but at this point, you know, the pres Presidential Center is beginning, it's, is in its early stages. Um, and so uh, the, the larger question of what the museum is going to look like, the building can look like, I think those are all things that are a ways off yet. Um, but uh, the Community Advisory Committee has met several times already to be informing the process, uh, both the, the current members of the staff and also the consultants who are working with the Presidential Center to begin to develop that concept for what the museum is going to be. Um, an institution of this kind is usually takes several years just simply in the, in the pre-planning, um, and they're very early days with that. Um, but I will say that certainly the, a, a hallmark piece of that, and I think as you were referencing this, will be a collaboration with the Massachusetts Historical Society. And it's the Mass Historical Society that, that cares for all of the Adams family papers. Um, and so I think there's a real virtuous circle there in terms of the, the idea that the, the Historical Society would like to have other avenues and platforms for sharing those incredible resources uh, with members of the general public, the opportunity to collaborate with the Adams Presidential Center to provide ways for people who are coming here to Quincy to have an opportunity to see those letters uh, in, in person, I think is going to be a really huge piece of, of how the center works and uh, one of the unique resources that it provides. Well, we'll all have to stay tuned to that. Uh, in just the last uh, two minutes, actually, uh, we'll talk about this maybe more in a subsequent program, but um, I guess gearing up your department along with um, your association with other organizations for Quincy's 400th. Yes, yes, the Quincy 400 um, was really gaining some wonderful momentum when along came COVID and interrupted a few things in our lives. Um, and it is back ramping up as we start to look at, we're only what, 16 months away, 18 months away from, from the 400th anniversary in the community. Um, and uh, I am one of the members uh, that helped to, to move the 400 along. Uh, and I'm pretty confident, I'll just say, I'll just forecast for you, I'm pretty confident that the community is going to be hearing a lot more about the 400 uh, this fall as we move forward. Well, very good, Bob. Thank you uh, for coming in and finally having me get my act together to actually bring you into the studio to discuss this. And certainly it won't be the last time you and I will chat. Well, thank you for, again for having me, Mark. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. And you're welcome back. If you didn't thank get you. that from what I, I just I would said. love it. Just okay. give me a call. I'm happy to do it. Great. Thank you, Bob. And uh, thank you at home for watching. And please remember to support uh, Quincy Access Television for more community programming just like this.